Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went on a journey. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to obtain his produce. But the tenants seized a servant, and one they beat, another they killed, and a third they stoned. Again he sent other servants, more numerous than the first ones, but they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and, and acquire his inheritance. They seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? They answered him, he will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyards to other tenants who will give him the produce at the proper time. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures that the stone reject, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? By the Lord has this been done. And it is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of heaven will be taken from you and give to a people that will produce fruit. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Vi, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. Whenever the parables are preached in the Gospels, there are all sorts of applications that can be made. What's he talking about with the vineyard? You talking about the world? Is he talking about the church? Let's, for the sake of argument, look at the vineyard as being the, the, the church. And one of the things that we need to understand is among those who were chosen, the apostles, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, and I'm sure they did, had no idea, but isn't this great? We're going to be the apostles. They're going, to, they're going to write about us for centuries to come, okay? They didn't know that. But anyway, you would think, wow, how incredible to be chosen one of the 12. Little did they know that the price of their discipleship was going to be their martyrdom. Little did many know throughout the centuries that the price of discipleship was going to be martyrdom. Little did people know that not only did they want to destroy the servants, but throughout the ages, they wanted to destroy the church. If you think about it, the church has had a very, very troubled history. Some due to people inside the church, some due to people against the church. When we look at our uh, tradition of the church, there were so many holy, wonderful examples in the church. And there were a lot of really bad examples. Popes who've had illegitimate children, Popes who've been beat to, get, uh, beat to death at the hands of a jealous husband, you know. Uh, we, I mean, what's more disturbing than this recent crisis that we've been through with clerical abuse? I mean, it's horrible. So there's always been a human element, and there's always been a divine element in the church. And that comes from 
the gospel we had a month or so ago when our Lord said, You repeat it upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. That promise that the church would endure is came from our Lord himself when he gave to Peter, I'll bestow upon you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you declare bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you declare loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He promised that the church would endure. You know, when Pope Benedict was elected, he was looking at a church that had become really fractured. You know, you had theologians preaching stuff that was heretical. You had people in leadership that were preaching heresy. You had whole countries and bishop conferences that were moving away from the teaching of the church. And so Pope Benedict talked about cafeteria Catholics. He talked about people who go through a cafeteria like, you know, we go through a cafeteria. We leave the beets and we leave the spinach, but we, you know, pick up the fried chicken, okay? You just pick and choose what you want out of the church, you know? Yeah, you can justify this, but you can't justify that. Yeah, I can, I can be a good Catholic and I can be pro-choice. I'm sorry, you really can't. Life is a fundamental issue. God is the author of life, saying that it's okay for us to not let an unborn child be born. You can't reconcile that to the teaching of the church. You really can't. And when people talk about it, it being a choice and not a child, and those people who talk about it as a choice and not a child, they talk about it as a fetal mass. Don't hand me that stuff. And I'm not going to say crap on television, okay? But don't hand me that stuff. The thing is, is that they, you know, this fetal mass. Okay, leave it alone. It's not going to come out of turnip. It's going to come out of human being. You know, it's not going to come out mineral or vegetable. It's a human being. Just leave it alone. Don't kill it. It's human life. And regardless of what Nancy Pelosi says, we've always taught that ensoulment takes place at the moment of conception. That's when we get a soul, at the moment of conception. So when, we, when Pope Benedict saw this, he said, you know what? We may be a smaller church, but we need to be a more faithful church. There are a lot of issues out there that we need to understand a part of this church. And the idea that we can change them because society has changed them, the idea that this so-called Illuminati or the enlightened people have now told us that, you know, of course two people can marry, uh, you know, same sex. The new one is sologamy. You marry yourself. Go ahead, man. You marry yourself? Isn't that wonderful? Is the honeymoon any different from last night? You got me. I have no idea. But this is the selfie generation who it all revolves around me and there's no one good enough for me, so I'm going to marry myself. There you go. You want to call that a sacrament? Whatever. My point. My point is this, that when we talk about producing a fruitful harvest, the church can't go in certain areas. It just can't go in certain areas. We can't decide that we as a Catholic hospital can say, you know what? These people are old. There are no good medical options. They are in a situation 
where they're going to die. So we just want to help God along here. And we're going to actively bring about their death. We can't do that. We're not allowed to deny someone food and hydration. But we're, we, can't, we don't have to go to extraordinary means of hooking people up to machines to keep them breathing artificially. We don't have to do that. Making the decision to allow God to take over and deprive them of medical treatment you know, food and hydration have to be included. That's perfectly fine. But we can't make human life a decision that simply is something that we decide. I was speaking at a conference in Malta about human trafficking. And of course, there's, there's forced labor, there's uh, the prostitution, there's forced organ donation and stuff like that. And people were talking about human life and people don't deserve this and it's wrong and morally wrong and all that. And I was one of the last speakers to speak and I said, you know what? I agree. You can't do that to another human being. But when you live in a society who feels they have the right and the privilege to decide who gets to be born and when someone is supposed to die, then human life becomes a matter of opinion. We let society decide if we're going to kill our unborn. We let society decide whether or not we're going to kill our elderly and our infirm. So let society decide whether or not we want to sell a 12-year-old for sexual purposes or force an 8-year-old into forced labor or to rob from a 20-year-old an organ to sell it in the first world market to make a lot of money so that the rich get to live better than the poor. You can't do that. It's a slippery slope. When we were studying moral theology, they talked about the wedge argument. The wedge argument is you get your foot in the door. Eventually, you can kick the door wide open. The wedge argument is being played out in our midst. If we can kill this, this group, then why can't we kill this group? And then why can't we, like Nazi Germany, decide people with mental deficiencies or retardation issues shouldn't live? Why can't we decide we get to experiment on living humans? That's better than white mice any day because they had no quality of life to begin with. Why can't we decide that? See, that's the vineyard. That's what our Lord is talking about when we're called to produce a rich and fruitful harvest. And the role of the church is to produce a harvest that's pleasing in the sight of God in accord with the law of God. And we, as his people, don't get to go through the cafeteria and leave the beets and the spinach and just choose the fried chicken. We have to understand the teaching of the church, the reason why the church teaches that, and then we have to live in accord with that. A lot to deal with, but it's real. Stay with us, we'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable, and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey's over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. Jesus said to them, 
Did you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone? By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in your eyes. The stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone, and by the Lord has this been done. So many times during the course of our rich history, we have people preaching the truth and paying for it with their lives. We see with John the Baptist when he told Herod it was wrong for him to take his, his brother's wife. His wife decided she wanted his head on a platter. She got it. We see Henry VIII, see St. Thomas More. Time and time again, there has been a price that people have to pay for the truth. And before he died in 1979, Archbishop Fulton J. Singh says, we have entered into the post-Christianity era. Now back in 1979, I didn't really understand that. In 1979, I thought there was still some sanity left, okay? Uh, he was prophetic. We're living in a post-Christianity era. How many times do you preach the gospel message about current events and we're thought to be anti-phobic or a hate crime. In, the Christmas, in his Christmas address in 2012, Pope Benedict, in his address to the Cardinals, urged them to do everything that they could to fight the same-sex marriage movement around the world. In 2013, there was a demand to put the Roman Catholic Church in the United States on the list of an official hate group on the White House website because we were going to fight same-sex marriages. The cornerstone of the preaching of our Lord is being rejected. It's being rejected in the society in which we live. You know, I'm in the process of of working to build a shelter for juvenile victims of human trafficking. And federal law says we cannot have a fence up because you cannot hold anyone 14 years of age or older against their will. Hello? Anybody out there listening? All you parents who tell your 14 year old they have to come in, they can't walk out of the house dressed like that, you're punished from your iPhone or your iPad or whatever it is you're doing, you can't stop your child from going to that party or that prom or whatever, you're illegal. It's law. It's law. Are you serious? Yeah. So let your 14-year-old get hold of that and call the police because you told them they can't go to a party. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, 
that Fulton Sheen was right. We are in a post-Christianity era, era. Parents. Where are the rights of the parents? Well, you know, there's some bad parents out there who've done some terrible things to kids. And because of that, we've got all these children's rights at the expense of parents' rights. Okay? Yeah, there is, but that, that's the way it works. The tail wags a dog. The tail wags a dog, and because some have abused it, then everyone suffers for it. You know, when the Supreme Court decided that now, you know, people of the same sex can marry each other. In my parish, we had a gymnasium that we rented out. Somebody wanted to rent it for a, a wedding reception. Somebody wanted to rent it for a family reunion. You know, someone wanted to hold some special event there. We rented it out. We donated it to civic organizations, but the other ones, we rented it. The day they made same-sex marriages a, a law, no one can any longer rent our parish hall. Used for parish activities only. Why? Because if I charge the Smith family $300 to use my hall for their family reunion and the same-sex couple who wants to have their wedding there and I say, I'm sorry, it's not available for that. Now I'm discriminating. By renting it, I was a commercial enterprise. By letting, renting it to the Smith family for their family reunion. By not renting it for same-sex marriage, I'm discriminating. Wow. Should I throw in the towel? Should I say, well, I have no control over it? Or should I keep fighting for what the church teaches? Currently, in Australia, there's a huge move. They're trying to criminalize priests who hear confessions of children who've been abused and don't report it to the police. They're saying that if someone, some child says I'm being abused, if the priest does not go to the police, they're thinking the priest should serve a jail sentence. Same challenges going on in this country, been going on for the last eight years. But the stone that's rejected, the stone that re was rejected was our Lord. And standing in stark contrast has made us the villains. The fact that that uh, HHS healthcare bill forced Catholic employers to provide birth control uh, medication for their employees, it shut down countless Catholic institutions. They got tired of paying the million dollar penalty for not providing birth control, which is against our teaching as a church. You should be able to know that. Yet we, we still uphold the fact that if your country club says you can only wear white on the tennis court, country clubs have a right to enforce that. We don't have a right to say that we will not buy birth control uh, medications through our insurance plan for our employees. It's all pretty much upside down. The amazing thing is, and this is so politically incorrect to say it, but as you know, that's something very new for me. I just built a church and bought the contents out of a church in Syracuse, New York, and wanted to buy the windows. Some disgruntled parishioner had put that on the national, I mean, the local historical register. They said I couldn't have the windows. 
because they were part of the external integrity. We appealed. We proved that they never were part of the external integrity. They didn't come into existence until 10 years after the church was operating. They turned down our appeal. So we took the contents, left the windows. Then it was sold to a mosque who went to the same board that we went to and said, we're not Christian, we want to darken those windows. We're not Christian, we want to cut five crosses off the top of that church. We're Muslim, we're scared of, for security reasons, we want to put a 10-foot fence. That same board said, that's fine. Besides, we would never do anything to interfere with religious liberties. You're protected by federal law. They were protected by federal law. We as Catholics were not. Something wrong with this picture. The problem is, is within our own church, we have those who say, you're totally wrong for not marrying same-sex people. You're totally wrong for not distributing birth control. You're totally wrong for not uh, making life a matter of choice. You're totally wrong for that. That's the challenge. When Pope Benedict said we may be a smaller church, but we'll be a more faithful church, you really have to understand that this is not the opinion of the local bishops conference. The, the sanctity and the dignity of human life, of this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, these are things that come from God. These are things that have been rejected throughout history. And these are the things that many of our forefathers in faith have lived and died for. But unfortunately, in today's day and time, these are the things that a lot of people want to make a matter of personal choice. Reality is, you really can't have it both ways. We are in a post-Christian era, as Fulton Sheen says, as to whether or not we're gonna do anything to maintain our Christianity depends on the next generation being willing to pay the price. We thank you for being with us today. May each day bring you closer in your walk with the Lord. God bless you.